Good morning, everyone. For the record, Delegate Julian Ivey here, Vice Chair of the Prince George's County Delegation, uh, bringing this meeting to order. Today is Friday, uh, the 19th of March, 2021. Uh, we're here today um, with so many uh, very important individuals from Prince George's County. Before we get to our meeting, before we have our prayer, um, I just wanted to have a brief moment of silence. This is a year ago this week uh, where we first got into this pandemic. Uh, and since then, over 1,300 individuals from Prince George's have lost their lives. So if we could just have a brief, brief moment of silence. Thank you. Um, this morning, we are joined uh, by Delegate Veronica Turner uh, to lead us in prayer. Delegate Turner. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, bow your heads, everyone. Gracious God, maker of all things, holy, good, and pure, we gather together to say thank you this morning for bringing us this far in our individual journeys and the journey to serve the people of Prince George's County. This has been a difficult, sad, and grief-sticking year. We, and we still say thank you. Thank you for allowing us to find ways to stay connected, to do, the, to do our work. Thank you for keeping our children safe and providing ways for teaching the teachers of Prince George's County and the state of Maryland to continue to teach and care for our children. We humbly ask that you continue to bless and keep us as we use our hearts and minds to make decisions that affect people we will never know. Help us to find mindful when making decisions and issues that do not affect us personally or, our or for our constituents. Lead us and continue in your will and your way. I am thankful. We are blessed. These things we ask, we do in the name of the Holy Three. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Delegate Turner. Amen. Um, this morning, we're joined by the CEO of our public schools, uh, who is a, a big favorite here uh, on our county delegation. Um, Madam CEO, Dr. Monica Goldson, thank you for joining us. If you could please uh, give us your presentation and I'm sure there will be a, a handful of questions at the end. Sure, thank you so much. I, before I begin, I wanna say if you hear banging, it's because it's our radiator. We're in a really old building. We call it affectionately Mrs. Sasser, um, but <laughs> you might hear that noise. That's what it is. Eventually it'll stop. So. Good morning, Vice Chair Ivy and members of the Prince George's County House Delegation. It is an honor to be with you this morning. I wanna begin with just a several thank yous for your continued support of the Prince George's County Public School professional family and the students and families we serve. From the beginning of this pandemic, which is hard to believe was a year ago, until now you have reached out individually or collectively to find ways to support our students and staff whether it was through donated PPE, meal distribution, or virtual experiences that allowed our students to earn their community service credit, I truly appreciate it. And while Prince George's County Public Schools is not the only district in the state of Maryland that has seen a decrease in enrollment due to the pandemic, I wanna thank you for being strong advocates on holding us harmless in student enrollment for this year, which has a major impact on our financial stability. And more importantly, I wanna thank you for understanding the, that overturning the Kerwin veto is more than just a legislative bill for students, families, and employees of our community. This is our blueprint for systemic investments and priorities and for showing students that they matter most. I especially wanna thank uh, Vice Chair of Ways and Means, Delegate Alonga Washington, and Appropriations Subcommittee Chair, Delegate Ben Barnes for ensuring that Prince George's County Public Schools remains in the forefront when making the right investments so that, and decisions so our students can succeed. 
I firmly believe that to whom much is given, much is required. So we've created a web page titled a Blueprint for Prince George's County Public Schools, funding for programs, initiatives, and facilities. This web page provides quarterly updates on all provisions of the Kerwin legislation to ensure that our community is aware of how we are utilizing the funds that you advocate for daily. And I have provided, I will be providing you all with the first quarter report for 2021 in your email at the conclusion of this meeting that will be posted on April 1 for our community. And I wanna thank you for your continued support of our public-private partnership recently approved by the County Council and the Board of Education to build six new middle schools in the county in the fall of 2023. This game-changing approach will allow us to build, design, and maintain a new Drew Freeman, Hyattsville, Kenmore, and Walker Mill Middle Schools, as well as a new middle school and K-8 school in the Delphi and Southern areas of the county, supporting approximately 8,000 students. In January, we announced the creation of a $1 million endowed fund that will support students through scholarships and additional commitments for student internships, mentoring opportunities, and apprenticeships. The program has hosted five MBE, CBE, outreach events, and we've had 600 companies to register to attend with 400 companies participating to date. And the program will continue to host outreach events every month. In addition to the outreach events, we are scheduling matchmaking events and pre-qualification workshops to provide insights and teaming opportunities for qualified companies to participate in our program. We have a lot to be proud of. We are now seeing small signs of a new normal as we begin the process of welcoming 42,000 students back into our schools. Our central office employees have resumed working at their assigned locations and our school-based staff has returned to work and are teaching from school buildings. Reopening safely for students, employees, and our broader community has remained my highest priority. As a school system, we have followed science and data in developing our reopening plans and proceeded thoughtfully at every stage. Now, as metrics continue to decrease in Prince George's County, we are preparing to open our school buildings for in-person hybrid learning next month. Under the hybrid schedule, students will split their time between in-person and remote learning, two days in-person and three days virtually. Families also had the option to continue virtual learning at home for the remainder of the school year. And approximately 128,000 responded to our learning preferences survey. While the design to return was personal for each family and reflects their child's learning style, I could not ignore the impact of prolonged school closure on our students academically and from an overall social and emotional wellness perspective. Nothing can replace the interaction between students and teachers and classmates. On April 8th, phase one instruction will begin with a two day hybrid learning schedule for all special education students in kindergarten through 12th grade and students in pre-K through grade six, along with 12th grade. And then on April 15th, phase two instruction will begin for all remaining students in grades seven, eight, nine, 10, and 11. When our schoolhouse doors closed last March, more than a quarter of our employees continued working inside our school and office buildings. They are my heroes. I am referring to our building maintenance teams and our food service workers. Our bus drivers rejoined us last fall to deliver meals throughout Prince George's County neighborhoods. Our administrators and educators and building services teams are busy preparing our buildings for in-person learning. We began using new protocols for cleaning and sanitizing in January that are aligned with CDC guidelines, posted signage throughout school buildings to help guide our learners, upgraded our air filtration system with MERV 13 air filters in every school and office building, and stocked our warehouses with personal protective equipment for staff and students. Additionally, each school has a COVID compliance committee comprised of numerous staff members to address health and safety issues weekly. All staff are required to conduct daily self-checks using a frontline education mobile app, allowing the principal and other designated staff to collectively timely, to get timely data from staff for contact tracing purposes and to monitor 
who has experienced COVID-19 symptoms, been exposed to others who've had COVID-19, or who have tested positive. Our schools are also equipped with directional signage, and we are making sure that we um, require all employees and staff to wear their mask and to social distance. Our partnership with Prince George's County Health Department and Kaiser Permanente was a key component in providing a safe work and school environment. We were able to serve 10,170 employees who wanted to be vaccinated. This is 1,500 more vaccinations than we expected after surveying our staff in January. We continue to make information on vaccination clinics in the community available to employees through internal communications channels. The vaccination clinics were a tremendous benefit to our employees, and I appreciate the efforts of our county executive, the county health department, Kaiser Permanente, and our school nurses to make us Prince George's County crowds to be protected. It is clear for many students, distance and learning sure. has clear limits. They need additional support beyond what can be offered virtually. While our educators have done an incredible job standing up distance learning programs completely from scratch, the reality is that the pandemic dictated our pivot toward virtual instruction. As educators, we always understood that the virtual world could not compete with in-person teaching. That is practically true for students with special needs, our English language learners, and those, whose fam and those who are coming from families who are economically disadvantaged. For many students, the interaction between educators and classmates is critical to their academic progress and success. Sadly, we know that school systems throughout the country and even those close to home are grappling with some of the same challenges we're facing here in Prince George's County Public Schools. We are committed to learning from our peer districts as we work to close the learning gap. We are using this data to help inform our work around one-to-one -one literacy and mathematics tutoring, summer interventions, and individually paced high school instruction. We will continue to improve instruction and provide summer enrichment options and any enhanced efforts, supports needed to begin the 2021-2022 academic year. Delegates, thank you for being my partners in this work and for inviting me to speak today. I will now take questions. Thank you, Madam CEO, uh, for all the work that you're doing uh, through this really troubling time. Uh, Delegate Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, Dr. Goldstein. It's so good to see you, and I'm glad that you and your team are doing well, and thank you for all the work um, that you're doing on behalf of Prince George's County and for mostly for our kids. Um, my question um, really has to do um, or, uh, pertain to our English language learner students, which I have a huge population of in my district. I think that challenge combined with parents that are so essential workers and um, internet access and at-home care, I, I'm just terrified of um, the gap that's going to be occurring and what kind of creative ideas or things that maybe you all have been doing that we're not aware of or things you will be doing um, for us to support would be great. That's my first question. And then this, my second question is, um, and I'm looking at Delegate Watson because we serve in judiciary together, um, that keeps me up on, at night is the very much so is um, the, you know, as our, our school system is one of our biggest places of mandatory reporting for child abuse. And I just think about um, the children that are facing unspeakable um, assault and other things I won't say here that are happening at home or wherever they are because they're not in school. Um, so those are my two um, questions and what's being addressed for those kids. And, you know, I'm sure you have the numbers of where you can pull what schools have kind of higher um, abuse mandatory reporting than others and how we how we help these kids. So those are my two very big questions. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Goldson, for being here. Thank you so much, Delegate Fisher. So our, our, we have nine parent centers that we utilize across the school district where parents can go in the morning from eight to 10 or in the evening from six to eight. Those parent centers were definitely created for our English language learner families. We did a survey at the beginning of this pandemic after um, we had been through about a month or two of the experience and wanted to know ways we could support our community. And our English language learner community said, look, we need places we can go to to get support. The online was not completely working. 
And so we'll continue to offer those parent centers. They're there to help parents with homework, technology issues, Wi-Fi access, you name it, we're providing it in those centers. And our parent liaisons, um, bilingual parent liaisons are the ones who actually are housed in those locations. For safety reasons, we do ask them to call and sign up just so we don't want a large number of people in one location. But I can tell you every slot um, when we have them open or filled, and I'm grateful for that because that came really from them. The other piece of it around um, our one-to-one -one and closing that digital divide, we used the very first batch of CARES Act funds to make sure that we had enough technology for every student in the district so that we would not have to worry about if there was a family who did not have that access. But having technology was just one part of it. We also are paying for Wi-Fi access for those families who are on free and reduced meals, those who are not and have found them in their families in situations where they can't afford Wi-Fi. And we have purchased to date a thousand hotspots so that if we have communities or families who can't access Wi-Fi, we'll give them a mobile hotspot that they can utilize for that piece. And then lastly, around a mental health and wellness piece, that has been key throughout this pandemic and that's been important. And so throughout the week, um, our teachers are doing social emotional activities and lessons with students. We also put it in our weekly engaged newsletter to parents and our teachers have indicators to look for for signs in our students. So if a child has been missing, um, let's say they've been in class, but they haven't had their screen on for two days consecutively, we, they find strategies to get them to cut their screen on so that we can see if there are signs of abuse. I will say our parent centers have been very helpful but our schools have actually not been closed. And we have had situations where students have gone to the school um, to, as if they were going to get technology help and really went to the school to report some situations that they were experiencing that were not um, to their best um, physical and emotional well-being, which allowed us to immediately contact social services to get them some support. Mr. Chair, will you indulge me with a, a quick follow-up? Sure. Um, thank you so much for that, Dr. Olson. So would you say how far part of our, our mandatory reporting numbers do you know from post up, I guess, pre-pandemic to now? They're ex they are dramatically less than what they were when we were in-person learning. So we are hoping that the 42,000 students that will return now in three weeks will also allow us to put a face, an eye on a third of our population to see if we notice any anomalies that are also taking place. But they're substantially less than where they were this time last year. Delegate Turner and then Delegate Williams. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. Good morning, Dr. Goldstein. Good morning, Delegate Turner. Good morning. Good morning. I am sitting here taking notes, and um, I think you probably said all these things. But did you, did you, if you could just answer just a couple of questions. Okay, <laughs> building six uh, middle schools, is any of them in my area, in South County, uh, up there where National Harbor is and up that area, anywhere up there? So there will be a school in the southern area of the county, a K-8 in the Akakeek area. Akakeek area. Yep, in Tantalian. Oh, in Tantalian? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, in Akakeek. Okay, I got that. Number two, I, I said, I heard you said uh, we got four, uh, all of these students, 42,000 students, they're going to be back to school in three weeks. Okay, and... Um, and then it's got opening next month. What did you say? Opening school next month. Okay. So that's in April, correct? Correct. April 8th and 15th. Eight, April 8th and 15th. Okay. I'm taking notes. Are we going to get any of the, uh, the things that you have, your report? Can you send us? I, at the some conclusion of this, I sure you, will. Because yep. my notes are not the best. Yep. And I will. You, and you said a lot that we need to know. Yep. What I'll send you our is, constituents. Yeah. 
I'll send you a brief PowerPoint that's about eight slides that has all of this key information, which you can include in a newsletter or, all, or actually send out to your constituents. And I'll also send you a link to our website that lists all of the resources around reopening so you too can use that for your listserv. And I'll send that to okay. everyone. Oh, thank you so much. And, and, and thank you to all of your staff that you got here. They're wonderful people. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Uh, Delegate Williams. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Dr. Golson. So good to see you this morning. Um, I just have two yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just one to kind of piggyback. We're talking about the construction of the middle schools. And, you know, one of those schools is in my district, Heightsville Middle School. And I know that there were some town halls earlier this week. And there's been some concern about kind of the uh, relocation of the students, moving them over to Robert Goddard and some concerns from the Robert Goddard, Goddard students. I mean, so I just was wondering if you could provide or elaborate or provide an update with regards to how that's progressing. Yep, thank you for that question. Um, we've held several count town halls because of course we know in many of those schools, four of those six, two are new, they will have to actually be relocated because their construction will begin this summer. Um, we've been in conversation and dialogue with both communities that you referenced here. And we issued a letter last night with all those final decisions around where placement will be. I also shared that information with those um, delegates um, and senators last night so that you would have a copy of those letters before they went out to community. In summary, Hyattsville Middle School students in sixth grade and in the creative and performing arts program will go to Robert Goddard. And the students who are not part of the creative and performing arts program will go to Meadowbrook. Um, that is how we ended up um, as of late yesterday afternoon, but we did send that information out to parents, both in English and in Spanish. Okay, thank you very much. And then You're I have welcome. a follow-up question. Um, you know, Delegate uh, Fisher had mentioned, you know, that we serve on judiciary. One of the issues that has kind of come up, and I'm sure uh, my colleague, uh, Delegate Washington over in Ways and Means, they're dealing with this issue now regarding the student resource officers in our schools. And I know that you all did a survey, um, I think in the latter part of last year. And I just was wondering if you can give us an update with regards to the results of that survey um, and kind of where our, our Prince George's County public school community is on that particular issue. Yes, I'll provide a summary now, but I'll also include in the information I sent to you all the PowerPoint also that includes the survey results briefly so you can glance at it. We did a survey between December and January and had 13,000 respondents from our community that responded to a survey around SROs. 80% of our community wanted to keep school resource officers in our schools mainly at the high school level, then um, at middle and then we were surprised to see that there was an increase in number of communities that wanted it at elementary. We only have school resource officers at the high school level. Um, but what we did do is review all of the recommendations of the police reform task force, task force work group and have adopted the recommendations from that task force as we move forward in implementing those provisions. Thank you, Dr. Golson. I appreciate You're it. Welcome. You're welcome. And uh, just to piggyback on Delegate Williams' question, uh, former Robert Goddard Montessori uh, student myself, I, I am very grateful for the decision that she made um, the other day. Uh, it, it does lead me to um, ask if you could update us on the ventilation updates uh, for these various schools. Uh, I just remember being at Goddard and we had our own ventilation issues there when I was there. Yep. So very specific to Robert Goddard, they actually have a new HVAC system. Um, and so yes. does another elementary. But um, in terms of all of our 206 schools and our additional offices, um, in accordance with CDC guidelines, we have implemented um, new air filters in all of our facilities that are MERV 13 in compliance with CDC guidelines. In addition, they also have some provisions that recommend that we run our HVAC system a few hours before entry of students and adults, several hours after, and that we open windows a few hours before students and staff arrives. I had the opportunity to visit William Work Middle School on Wednesday, which is um, the day that all of our staff returned. And while um, the school was freezing because they had all their doors and windows open, um, it was another provision and safety precaution that we took to make sure the air continued to circulate. In addition, we used our CARES Act funds to buy 3,000 air filtration portable machines 
And those are for those schools where locations do not have outside windows or exteriors where the air could circulate. We're starting with the distribution of those in our ECC, our early childhood centers, where we have some of our um, high um, students with disabilities at such a low age, and then increasing to those sites where there'll be 40 to 50% of the students returning um, in April, and then working our way to those classrooms where there are no window access. Thank you uh, very much. Next, we're gonna go to the Vice Chair of Ways and Means, and then to Delegate Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Golson. Great to see you as always. Um, thank you for all your hard work for our school system and for our students. You know, I just have to ask you about one quick question that I know that I know was sent to you, um, which is about our community schools. And uh, we know we have a lot of them in our school jurisdiction, and we also have been funded. We funded them at a very high level at the state uh, to provide a behavior health specialist as well as as community schools coordinator. And I think my question is, because I met with your coordinator who was on his way out of the school system last year, and uh, I had some concerns about uh, how it's being implemented, how things are being tracked at the school, how um, students are being tracked to, to make sure that they're receiving the services and what are the outcomes of those services, and to be able to do a whole community assessment of, uh, of the needs of the, of the school too. And so I wondered, um, you know, I've visited Baltimore City, uh, who has a packet of who has a package that's a, a set of guidelines for the community school coordinators. And I wonder where that is in our county, where we are in developing that for our county. And also, can you just speak to a little bit of how the expectations that are set for each community school um, and the goals that are set? Um, and I, I, I say this, and I want to just heighten. I just want to elevate this conversation because, or this issue, because for our mem for our members of the delegation, you know, this is our key to resolving poverty in our schools. You know, creating more community schools. So, it's, and we're 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 sending millions of dollars to our school system in order to do this, and we want it to be the most effective community schools in the state of Maryland. And I know Dr. Golson feels that way too. And so we just want to want to make sure that we're doing it in a way that it benefits our students and we're able to look at the outcomes of the services that we provide to our students. So Dr. Golson, thank you. Yes, thank you. So if you all are very well aware that we have 65 community schools in our district, 45 that were granted in 2019-20 and then a 20 additional ones for this school year. All of our uh, assessment reports are done. They were completed by the end of the last school year and those needs and supports um, have been published. We utilized the support of United Way to vet all of those wraparound services to make sure that our community schools could select organizations to support them that um, have been research driven and could do those services and reports with fidelity. As I shared earlier in my presentation, we have created a website that we will also, I will also send you a link that allows our community to review where we are on a quarterly basis around implementation and utilization of funds for Kerwin. Um, and we also will put a quarterly report on the status of not just our community schools, but every provision that is a part of Kerwin. That report I'll send to you today. It will be posted on our website April 1 um, for our community and those reports get posted weekly. We also have a community schools website, which allows our community to see the hard work that our community coordinators are doing. Um, where they've been in the news around those wraparound supports, whether it was in meal distribution, workshops on domestic violence, um, teacher, I mean, parent workshops on how to support their child, um, backpack distribution with supplies and hand sanitizer and PPE for families. We've listed all of that on our community school website. In addition, our community school coordinators do have a guide that shows them how they should work um, and, and what our expectations are in ways that they not only support the staff and students in their school, but how they must be accessible to our community. So we'll make sure that you get that information, but more importantly, that we also provide you that link so that at any time you so desire, you can access that information so you could see where we are as a community. Um, as I shared before, to whom much is given, much is required. And I wanna be as transparent to our community as possible. You are there fighting to continue to increase our current funds. And I wanna make sure our community knows how we are utilizing those funds. 
Um, and so we'll continue to provide that information to you. Dr. Gosen, thank you for that response. You know, I, I, I appreciate that. I know that, you know, I met with a couple of coordinators already in our school. You know, we're talking about services, the services that we can offer to students, you know, tracking those metrics of how students are being, uh, are progressing uh, through this program and how we're getting families out of poverty and tracking that. Is that gonna be placed on a website on a quarterly basis? The reports and the, the how many parents are actually go, going to these seminars? Will that be on the website as well? Yep, it will be. Um, we actually have listed also already, if you go to the website, you'll see how many students are already participating in our programs. If they're, whether it's tutoring, whether it's how many workshops they've attended, that report will have that. In addition, we hold a monthly meeting where I um, monitor how many students are participating, what schools have been completely engaged in parent support, how many parents have come out, um, and we have designated specific staff to monitor solely just um, implementation of Kerwin as well as now the provision of our CARES Act grant. So that very specific information will be included in that quarterly report as well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Delegate Watson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you again, uh, Ms. Golson. Quick question for you. As we continue to monitor what's going on with CDC, and, and now I heard this morning that CDC guidelines for schools say that it's safe to go from six feet between students to three feet. I uh, just want to know how you're managing those changes. Are you just going to stick to one plan? And also, how are you addressing sanitation and, and soap and hand sanitizers within the school? I've gotten a couple of emails about that. Yep. Thank you. So on our website, we actually post daily the COVID-19 numbers for our, our county. Um, and then I review those numbers and then I also track them in an Excel spreadsheet. I can tell you that since January 22nd, we have had a steady decline of COVID-19 cases. And right now, one of those three metrics are in the low risk category. I expect two, the additional two measures to move to the moderate to low category by the time we return for the reopening of school. But as we continue to monitor those metrics, I am in constant contact um, with the health department as well as the DCAO for health and human services from our county government so that we're monitoring student, the COVID numbers for the county. We have um, protocols in place if we have a child who's in a classroom who becomes um, symptomatic, we will be doing rapid testing and then diagnostic testing on site in our schools. And we will isolate that child in what we call our care room, separate from our nurse's office, contact their parent, as well as those parents who've been in contact with the parents of the children who've been in contact with that student so that they can go to immediate quarantine. We are monitoring if there are more than two or more cases in a school where we believe there might have been close contact so that we can then begin the process of putting that entire school on um, quarantine and closure. And then we're also monitoring numbers at the state level, at the county level. So we will continue to monitor and make provisions as necessary to keep our staff and students safe upon the return for full in-person and hybrid learning in April. Now, I, know you've, I, know you've, I know you offered COVID shots to every employee of the school system. What is the percentage of the uh, school system population folks that took you up on that? Yep, 52% of our population took us up on that. Okay. We have Thank a total, you. yep, 19,000 employees. When we did a survey in January, 8,500 said they wanted the vaccination. And then we were able with, through public information and facts around the vaccination, we're able to increase that to 10,170. Yes. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chair. Delegate Valentino Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, just wanted to take a brief second or, or a minute to thank you. Um, you have really, served one of the largest school systems in the state. And as a matter of fact, probably the top, I think, what is it, 15 in the country through a Herculean effort. And every time I contact your office, I get immediate responses with substantive information in them. Um, it's almost like you never sleep. I, I don't know how, um, how you do it. And I've had a lot of compliments 
families in my district with the information that they're getting and that you're sending out and the efforts that you took to feed children and to feed all children, whether they were in the uh, public school system or not, but to use the schools and the staff and everything was really incredible. So I just wanted to thank you. I thank you for making sure that we found ways to quickly increase as we started this pandemic, as most of you all know, we thought we were gonna be out for two weeks and we started with nine sites for food distribution and we're up to 206 and still deliver meals to communities that cannot get to our school sites. So thank you. And I will in the interim work with you because I'm the house uh, chair of the Joint Committee on Ending Homelessness and I know uh, your sons are in there and, and, I, and in the interim when you get a chance to to slow down maybe, um, we'll work with you on those issues to help the families. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Goldson, for all that you've been doing through this pandemic. I'm sure that we'll be reaching out uh, with more questions as they arise, uh, but thank you for your time this morning. Thank you all, and thank you for your continued support of our students. Absolutely. Next, we're gonna move to uh, Ms. Victoria Bayless uh, with Luminous Health, uh, where she will present uh, her presentation. We also have our wonderful county executive, um, Angela Also Brooks, here to also participate in this presentation as well. Ms. Bayless. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I believe uh, Davion um, was on the line as well, as well as uh, Deneen Richmond with us. So Davion, did you have some remarks to get us started? Uh, sure. Uh, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the Prince George's County House Delegation. For the record, Damian Percy here on behalf of Luminous Health and Doctors Community Medical Center. Uh, nearly two years ago, we met with many members of this body to inform you of a partnership uh, that was being created between Anne Arundel Medical Center in Annapolis and Doctors Community Medical Center in Prince George's County. Uh, that partnership created a new regional health system that we know today as Luminous Health. Uh, today, during today's presentation, you'll hear from key members of the team. Uh, who you've already announced, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tori Bayless is the CEO of Luminous Health. Prior to that, she led Anne Arundel Medical Center, uh, and she has 20, 25, more than 25 years experience in management, leadership roles, um, in various health systems throughout the region. Uh, Deneen Richmond is the uh, newly appointed president of Doctors Community Medical Center, and uh, she most recently served as the chief quality and population health officer uh, for Luminous Health. Uh, prior to that, uh, she served in the uh, ANOVA Health System as Vice President of Performance Improvement and Outcomes. She's also held, held leadership positions at Holy Cross Hospital, Del Delmarva Foundation, National Committee of Quality Assurance, and most importantly, uh, our president of, of Doctors Community Medical Center is a resident of Prince George's County, and we are very proud of that. Um, so Tori will present on the state of Luminous Health and Deneen will present on two major projects that we're embarking on, our behavioral health facility and our desire to provide obstetrical care at the Doctors Community Medical Center campus. And after that, we'll hear from our county executive and her team. So on behalf of Luminous Health and Doctors Community Medical Center, I thank you all for allowing us to present. And uh, I'd be remiss if I don't thank the county executive and her team, Major Riddick, John Erzin and others, uh, for their vision and unprecedented level of support and partnership with Doctors Community Medical Center. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our CEO of Luminous Health, Mrs. Tori Bayless. Thank you very much, um, Davion. And, and Mr. Chair, uh, if it would be okay, we do have a couple of slides we might use to help uh, walk us through some of the highlights of what you'll hear from myself and 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 Deneen. And, and good morning, County Executive also Brooks. Thank you for, very much for joining with us um, in, in this update. So um, Davion did a great job telling you a little bit about um, Luminous Health, and we are um, renamed and rebranded in this community, uh, but we wanted to give you just a couple of facts and figures as to who we are. So it was the coming together of uh, Doctors Community Medical Center and Anne Arundel Medical Center, as well as a pretty robust um, outpatient network of community uh, practices, outpatient centers and the like. And this was formed actually in July of 2019. So we're in our second full year of operations. 
And a couple of the elements that we were very much focused on in the coming together was understanding the community health needs assessment in Prince George's County, and in particular, certain clinical services and programs where there were gaps and real need and trying to fill those gaps, both looking at behavioral health and OB care. So you'll hear a little bit more about that, but you see some of our facts and figures here. We did also, um, through Luminous Health, open a new mental health hospital in Annapolis. So our experience and depth in the behavioral health realm is, is increasing and expanding. Um, actually, in the height of the pandemic, we opened a new mental health hospital, and um, it's just a, a top need in, in many of our counties and across the state and, frankly, the, the country as well. So Luminous Health is, uh, we're about uh, 9,000 team members strong in terms of employees, volunteers, and our combined medical staffs. And we have just put forward and uh, would be happy to come back at a, at a future time to brief the delegation further on what we call Vision 2030. So Vision 2030 is our broad strategic plan for the next decade. And it sounds very lofty to be looking out 10 years. We are not trying to predict the future, but we are trying to set our course and help create some of that future. So Vision 2030 was approved by the governing board of Luminous Health, including Doctors Community Medical Center this past December. And in putting that vision forward, we talk about living healthier together. And a lot of the work that we're going to be doing is in very specific, deliberate uh, partnerships. Um, while we are a large system, we cannot do this on our own. So partnerships are a key theme as to how Luminous Health fits into the health ecosystem. We have also took we also took a lot of time to look at the legacy organizations and come up with a new set of uh, core values for Luminous Health. So I can talk a little bit about that as well. Um, as again, part of our Vision 2030, we have four new core values, and we use the acronym RISE. And we say that we we rise by lifting others, and those um, values are respect, inclusion, service, and excellence. So those are the, the the core tenets of what's guiding the work of Luminous Health now. And um, part of the commitment to Doctors Community Medical Center and in Prince George's County is that Luminous Health would be making several million dollar investment over the course of the first five years to add programs, services, and fill where there may be some gaps and needs in Prince George's County, not only on the Lanham campus, but in the community more broadly. One of the other key elements that we've been working on as we put together our Vision 2030, and certainly coming out of a lot of the um, unrest and social injustices and racism witnessed so clearly last year, is to double down on our efforts on health equity. Uh, in the past, Luminous Health has had a health equity task force all the way up to the governing board of the organization to focus on how we can increase equity, decrease disparities, and disrupt biases. And we've done that through a lot of different methodologies, including increasing the diversity of our leadership team and boards, also focused on uh, cultural competency training, now moving more towards cultural humility training, also collecting race, ethnicity, and language data, and also engaging in these robust community partnerships. Um, our new effort around that or invigorated effort is what we call the Heart Force. This is our health equity and anti-racism task force. And you can see some of the members here. We have uh, representatives of Luminous Health leadership, our governing boards, our medical staff, as well as key community partners to help set a, put forward a, a set of recommendations that will position Luminous Health to be a model, a role model nationally on issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, justice. And we want to um, couple that up with what we call our Vision 2030. So those recommendations will be forthcoming in June to our governing board and we will continue to bolster the work of uh, Luminous Health and uh, Doctors Community Medical Center in Prince George's County. So um, I will turn it over to my colleague, Deneen Richmond. As Davion mentioned, uh, Deneen um, has been at the helm of uh, Doctors Community Medical Center since September and was with Luminous Health for the two years prior as our Chief Quality Officer and brings just a depth of experience and expertise to the table. While she is a, a nurse by training, she also has her master's degree in healthcare management and administration. She also serves as a faculty member at GW training the next generation of healthcare leaders. So. Uh, Deneen, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Tori, and good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for a few minutes of your time today. Um, you know, I, but before I um, um, talk about some of the things we're doing in the community, and as Davion mentioned, the two areas where we're expanding services on the campus, I do want to just say that um, I am so proud uh, to be a lifelong Prince Georgian, and this is the first time in my long career that I've actually had an opportunity 
um, to give back to the community that has made me who I am. Um, so I care very deeply um, about that and, and very proud of that. Um, since I'm also following um, Dr. Golson, I should also mention that I am a product of the Prince George's County Public Schools, a graduate of Eleanor Roosevelt Science and Technology Program, so go Raiders. Um, so once again, lots and lots of connections uh, to the community and just so glad to um, be in this role and have this opportunity um, to really provide care for our community. Over the last year, um, a lot of our focus, um, is, as, as I know everyone here um, knows, has been around um, really making sure that we were here for the community um, as, it, as it relates to COVID-19. Um, like many, like every other hospital in this county, um, we, it has really been our focus for the last year. We had to stand up and have continued to stand up our hospital incident command structure. Um, at the height of the second surge in December, um, we were having an average daily census of around 60 COVID patients being cared for on any day here at Luminous Health Doctors Community Medical Center. Um, we were very fortunate in, 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 of, of having resources both within Luminous Health as well as the state alternative care site. Um, and we obviously had to do a lot of work um, similar to what, what Dr. Goldstein was talking about with the school system and really looking at our staffing and our supplies to make sure that we could um, safely take care of our patients in the community. Um, fortunately, we are seeing a little bit of a decline, a steady decline, I would say, over the past five weeks. In February, our census was averaging around 25 to 30 COVID patients. And in the last few days, it's been hovering closer to around 15 patients. Um, so we definitely hope that that trend um, continues um, and we will continue to focus on safe staffing, supply spaces and equipment. As we have a CNET census decline and even before that in December, we turned our efforts toward vaccination of um, first beginning with our employees. And if we could go to the next, thank you very much. Um, and, and now, and then very shortly after that, as the state cohorts opened up, um, pivoting to the community. So as part of our vision 2030, we have, uh, have incorporated a bold goal of vaccinating 500,000 community members in our service areas. As I mentioned, we started with our workforce in late December. Um, and you can see there that about 58 as a whole, 70% of the Luminous Health workforce has been vaccinated. And um, at doctors specifically, we are, have about 58% um, of, our, of our workforce that has been um, vaccinated. Um, we are doing a lot that we think will also be beneficial um, as we're continuing to work in the community um, to really answer our staff's question and, and get them to the point where they are ready to accept the vaccine. So we've brought in a number of, um, we've had a number of town hall meetings. Um, we've partnered with um, local stakeholders in our community. Um, we've participated and I've participated in town hall sessions. Um, and we brought those town hall sessions into our employees um, and, we'll, and, and they also have some information that we've been sharing with our communities. So it's, we know that this is an issue that we need to continue to address. But at this point, I'm pleased to share with you that we have also um, been able to do a, a, a really um, significant job, I would say, in vaccinating uh, um, Prince Georgians in the community. So we actually have partnered um, with a number of in, um, organizations. Um, currently, right now, we have two community vaccine sites. Um, the first one that we opened was at Reed Temple. Um, we've given almost 4,500 vaccines to Prince Georgians at Reed Temple in Glendale, Maryland, very close to our campus. A few weeks ago, we also um, opened a community-oriented vaccine center at Prince George's Community College. And we've already vaccinated over 3,700 Prince Georgians at that site. And actually, before we um, started with our community sites, we actually opened up our hospital boardroom um, and administered community vaccines um, there. So in total, we have actually vaccinated over 13,500 Prince Georgian residents um, through our um, boardroom and now through our um, two sites. And as of Tuesday of next week, we will be running a third 
Community Vaccine Site at First United Methodist Church of Hyattsville. Um, they've been a wonderful partner of ours um, last May. Um, we actually partnered with them as well as with the county. So I definitely want to thank County Executive Angela Also Brooks and her administration for their support that allowed us to open up a community-oriented COVID test site that operates three days a week, Monday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Um, and we have administered thousands of COVID tests at that site. And now we're very happy to now also be able to expand that um, to being able to give COVID vaccines to community residents. I think we all know that that area in Hyattsville um, has been one of the hardest hit areas in Prince George's County um, when you look at COVID cases and hospitalization. In addition to the stationary sites, um, we also have, um, have a mobile effort underway. So it's part of our multi-pronged strategy. Um, so you can see there on the map through our community health team, we've been sending them out into the community. Um, back in the spring and into the summer, we were doing COVID education and outreach and actually touched over 30,000 Prince Georgian residents through that effort. And most recently, that team is going out um, and partnering with um, community organizations, low income, senior housing, and other community groups to go to people who really would have still faced difficulties trying to get to one of our or other uh, vaccine sites or the other ones that are in operation throughout the county. Um, so through that effort, it's you know more like a 50 to 100 doses at a time. Um, but we have given over 314 first doses um, in Prince George's County. And we uh, are in touch and partnering with the local health department um, to allow us to coordinate our outreach to those vulnerable populations and communities with the outreach that the health department is also doing through their mobile vaccination clinics. So I wanna just very um, quickly um, share with you um, two areas where we are very shortly, it's our intent to enhance the services that we're able to provide um, to Prince Georgians. So the first area is in behavior health. And I think that we all know, um, particularly during COVID, but even prior to COVID, um, that there are a number of people suffering with mental health conditions and unable to get the care and treatment they need um, from a prevention point of view, as well as dealing with crisis situations that they may find themselves in. That's in respect. fact, over um, about one in 10 residents have mental health needs. Um, and we know that there's various, there's limited resources and some of those resources that previously existed in and outside of the county, but accessible to the county um, are no longer here. Um, when we look at the community health needs assessment and some of the other statistics, we also know that we're in the bottom quartile um, for the number of mental health providers that we have per residence. And we also know that a number, over half of county residents currently, um, when they require inpatient mental health care, have to leave the county with about 15 to 20% of them going to DC facilities. Ms. Ms. Richmond? Yes. My apologies, you're doing a wonderful job and we're very grateful. Unfortunately, we have a few members that have to leave to go to other uh, subcommittees. Uh, to participate. Um, and so we have one small item on our agenda, and I apologize, uh, but we're just having such a robust discussion. Uh, if we could move briefly um, to move this amendment for six, House Bill 615, uh, we need to do a favor for Senator Jackson, uh, if you don't mind. It shouldn't take long at all. No, no worries. And then we'll come back to Delegate Valentino Smith uh, for a question. I see that her hand is raised. Uh, but colleagues, uh, Council, could you read the amendment for House Bill 615? Sure. <clears throat> so this is the um, PG 40221 Natural Resources Sunday Deer Hunting Prince George's County. Um, the the explanation of the amendment, uh, amendment number one is technical and amendment number two uh, removes Prince George's County from the list of counties in which the Department of Natural Resources may authorize a person to hunt on public land designated for hunting on Sundays. So as amended, a person in Prince George's County is prohibited from hunting on public land designated for hunting on Sundays, uh, which is how it was uh, 
in the code prior to this bill being drafted. So this basically reverts that part back to the way it was. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. Do I have a motion on the amendment? And I just want to make sure that we have a quorum. Uh, I believe we do, but we we do. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm here. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd like to move favorable, but I initiated this, so I can certainly take any quick questions before we lose our quorum. I did speak to Senator Jackson, Delegate Valderrama, and Delegate Proctor about this about this amendment, and they were fine with it. Was yeah. that a favorable motion? I, I, I move favorable. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. We need to do a roll call? No. No, no not for the amendment. The amendment. Uh, okay. Thank you again, um, Mr. Morgan. Uh, and thank you. We're going to move Thank back. you so much, everyone. Thank you. And, and we will need a letter for the Environment and Transportation Committee, Mr. Morgan. Absolutely. Okay, that Crystal handle Crystal handles those letters, so I will push okay. the amendment through officially, and she'll thank get you. It. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much, and to everyone watching, thank you thank for you. your indulgence. We're going to return back uh, to the presentation, Ms. Richmond. Before we continue, Delegate Valentino Smith, did you have a question? I know the check will leave soon. Oh, thank you. No, I, I really appreciated the details of the vaccine information. And I just wanted to suggest you make sure that you send it to all of us and the opportunities so that we put it in our newsletters um, and get it out there. I have the link in for Luminous. Mr. Percy's been really good about getting us information. Thank you, Mr. Percy. Um, and but some of the details and everything as they're moving along, um, if you want us to use something more than just the Luminous link for getting people uh, the information on where the clinics are and everything, please make sure, or any community information, we can push out in our newsletters. Thank you. Thank you. So I will wrap up very quickly because I want to um, make sure that um, County Executive also works has time to, to speak. Um, the two areas that we are, um, where we're gonna be offering services are in behavior health um, with the renovation of a building on campus so that we can offer ambulatory as well as inpatient services pending the state CON. Um, I'm also wanna make sure that we um, definitely are so appreciative of the county um, because that would not have been possible without the county support um, through a very generous grant. Um, also, we are recognized that obstetrical care is another area of great need um, once again, an area that was raised as an opportunity in the community health needs assessment, the RAND reports and other reports, eight out of 10 women in Prince George's County currently go outside of the county um, to deliver their, their babies. And so we are also planning to submit a certificate of need um, to actually build a women's pavilion um, that will be able to accommodate and deliver up to 2,600 births a year. And obviously all of the other wraparound care related to that. So we're very excited to be able to bring behavior health services as well as obstetrical services um, to the Lanham campus here. And, and let me um, pause there and turn it over to County Executive also Brooks. All right, good morning. So good morning, everyone. Now, first of all, thank morning. you. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, uh, to our chair in his absence and to uh, and to our amazing delegation, thank you for, uh, for having us this morning. I'm certainly, I'm proud of Deneen Richmond, uh, another Prince Georgian, and wanna just thank her so much for, uh, for her leadership, uh, as well as wanna thank Tori Bayless. They have been absolutely amazing partners to us, uh, especially during this pandemic, uh, where we have met each month and sometimes more often than that, um, to make sure we are providing uh, the, the services that our residents need. Uh, to make it through this pandemic. I know the hour is late and many of you have voting sessions to go to and have to leave soon. And so I will uh, make sure that my comments are brief, um, but this could not be a more important discussion. This is the discussion that, uh, that we should be having uh, regarding behavioral health and mental health care for our residents. Uh, as you know, this pandemic has given us an opportunity anew to look at the inequities, to look at the injustices and to decide for ourselves what our social justice uh, agenda is going forward. I think COVID-19 helped us to unearth much of what we have known now for decades, the challenges with respect to getting access to healthy food, 
They caused us to have those comorbidities <laughs> during COVID-19. We are able to look anew at the health access, uh, the inequities that have existed there for decades and decades uh, that made our citizens uh, 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 unable to get to, in some cases, the health care that they have needed. And we know as well that Prince George's County has, has served as a behavioral health desert, meaning that so many of our residents who have needed help have had to go outside of our county um, to seek that help. We know also with social justice and police reform. And so this pandemic has given us a tremendous opportunity uh, to make sure that at the very top of our agenda is making sure we close the social justice gaps that have existed for a long time. The partnership that we have developed uh, with Luminous Healthcare, I wanna thank them. It is absolutely transformational. Uh, Major Riddick is on the line. I wanna thank him uh, because he too understood the urgency of what we're trying to address. I will frame it this way so that you understand exactly what we are trying to accomplish here. We know, and this number knocks my socks off every time I hear it, it's 70% of all of the people we arrest on any given day and take to our Department of Corrections here in Upper Marlboro are intoxicated when they arrive. 70% of the people that our police arrest and take to the Department of Corrections. We also know that a third of all of the individuals who we arrest and take to our Department of Corrections on any given day suffer from mental health conditions. And the saddest part of all of this is that we have as a society decided that it is more convenient for us to treat people who need love, compassion, and health care in jail than to, to treat them in facilities that respect their dignity. And so what I have decided to do, and many of you are aware of this, is I reallocated $20 million last year from a police training facility and reallocated that money for us to build out a mental health facility and an addictions care facility. What this means very plainly is that we believe that our loved ones should be treated in a hospital and not in the correctional facility. There are more beds in the Department of Corrections than in our hospital to care for those who are sick and who have mental illness. That's the plain truth of the matter. So this is a way for us and we need much more this, than just this one facility, but I wanna thank Doctors Hospital and Luminous for stepping up right away, uh, offering to be our partner and to make sure that we could begin to address this problem in earnest and to create a continuum of services that our residents will need to care for them uh, and to, to respect their dignity. So we're so excited that by the end of this year, we'll have the first floor of this facility uh, prepared to receive our residents. Uh, we believe that by next year, we'll have the second floor where we'll have the ability to treat inpatient, to have the beds ready. Uh, but this is absolutely transformational. Uh, again, it addresses so much of what the public has said they wanted. They wanted to make sure that the dollars we have are allocated in such a way uh, that they address the values of this community. And our values say, uh, which is why I reallocated the $20 million from a police training facility into mental health care and addictions care, it says that we value making sure that we treat people in the spaces that respect their dignity. So this is what this is about. Uh, we do need a certificate of need uh, for a portion of this uh, to, 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 um, to make sure we can build out that second level with the inpatient beds. I believe there are 16 all total. And so we're coming before the delegation today asking for your support uh, for that certificate of need. I know that Deneen also just spoke about obstetrics. And again, I'll just say this very quickly. There is no reason under the sun why Prince Georgians should have to travel outside of Prince George's care to get county to get care of any kind. And I believe that you all agree with me about that, uh, that we want to make sure our residents can receive care, deliver their babies and do everything else they need to do right here at home in Prince George's County. So this is a marvelous time for us to close up these gaps. These are two gaps that need to be closed right away. I wanna thank Luminous for stepping in. And let me just say this last thing about the, the dire need for this. I'm jumping off this call to meet with Cigna in just a moment. Cigna provides the healthcare uh, for our county employees. And I was so shocked to look at data today, and I shouldn't have been shocked. Um, they said that the, the highest chronic condition the, percent, the highest percentage of chronic conditions that we have in the county that people use their Cigna healthcare for was depression. That is the highest, a double digit number that we have. And if that's the number of people who are going to get healthcare for chronic conditions, you can only imagine how much really exists. We were treating at about 12%, uh, but that means to me that there are at least a fourth of our workforce who are suffering from depression, some of whom have not gone to get treatment. So now, so depression is the leading cause. That's number one. 
more people use their health care for depression than anything else uh, this year. So this is uh, a, an, an urgent need that we have. And I want to thank you for allowing me a moment to speak to it. And I do want to thank this delegation for all your tremendous work. Uh, we know you're working under adverse conditions, but you're down there fighting uh, to bring back every penny that belongs to Prince Georgians. And I, I want to thank you for that. And thank you again to Deneen and Tori uh, for your tremendous leadership and for your partnership. And you know what? The best is yet to come. So thank you again, everyone, um, for your uh, for your attention and for the partnership. Madam County Executive, thank you so much uh, for being here this morning. Um, we are all here uh, to help you move forward. Um, we're just grateful for the leadership that you've shown throughout this pandemic. Um, I know that you did bring up uh, something uh, that we need to be working together with, with this certificate of need. Um, we'll have some of those discussions separately uh, with Mr. Percy as well. Um, I did see Delegate Lehman with the hand up. Do you still have a question? Yes, um, really, really quickly, and thank you for the presentations and apologies to Luminous for the interruption because I, I have been um, a big champion of um, behavioral health services. I have, I have depression. I think many of you know that runs in my family, and I lost a brother to suicide about ten years ago. Um, actually, two days after I was sworn into my county council seat, and it's, it's devastating. Um, I wanted to understand when I was on the council, doctors had come forward and talked about um, going after a certificate of need for a behavioral health unit, um, which I was fully supportive of, especially in the wake of Laurel Hospital announcing it would be closing its behavioral health unit. So I wanted to ask two things to clarify where this unit will be, and then um, also whether there will be adolescent beds, because there is a huge need for adolescent beds. They they don't exist almost anywhere anymore. I'm not even sure if Prince George's Hospital Center still has adolescent beds. So could someone answer those questions, please? Sure, I'll, I'll be happy to um, answer those questions. And thanks again for um, everyone's time and support. Um, so doctors had previously submitted a certificate of need um, when prior to becoming part of Luminous Health. Um, as we looked at that certificate of need and had conversations with the state, um, we realized that it needed to be enhanced further. Um, so that particular certificate of need was withdrawn so that we could work now with the county and really um, submit this new certificate of need um, that, we, that will address some of the concerns that we were hearing from the state as well with the prior one. As far as adolescent care, we also recognize that that is a, a, a huge need on the ambulatory side, we will be able to treat adolescents. On the inpatient side, we're needing to, we have to start with um, adult beds only, and some of this has to do with some of the rules and licensing and the space allocation that we have um, and being a, in, in those 16 beds and some of the, we don't have the, um, we're unable to safely meet the needs of um, adolescents in that same location. Um, per some of the state licensing and regulations. But, you know, we do recognize that that is a huge issue and we will be offering services on the ambulatory basis to adolescents. Thank, thank you so much for that. And I guess to um, uh, Chair Ivy's question, how can this delegation help with the, the certificate of need? What, what do you need us to do? Um, you know, please do let us know. Yes, we definitely would appreciate and, and we'll follow up um, through Davion um, obtaining letters of support um, from all of you for both of our certificate of needs, um, the behavior health as well as the obstetric certificate of need. It's our intent to submit both of those certificate of needs next month um, in April um, so that we can move forward with the, with the process. And Delegate Lehman, I was just informed that those letters are currently being drafted and we'll review them uh, at a later date. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Ms. Richmond, uh, Ms. Bayless, of course, our county executive, a Angela Alsobrooks, thank you all so much for being here with us. Um, before we let you go, colleagues, do we have any more questions? Again, I want to thank you so much for your, thank you. For your dedication. Thank you all so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very have much. Have a great day. We appreciate the partnership. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there any other business for the delegation? No, no, Julian, we're all done. All right. I'm sorry, Delegate Ivy. I'm sorry. You're fine. It's okay. 
Everyone calls me Julian. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. That's going to conclude the hearing uh, for the Prince George's County delegation. Thank you so much.